So Michael, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'm here standing in front of Michael E. Gerber, uh, the author of the famous e-book series, um, and he's also nicknamed the godfather of business systems. Uh, what an absolute honour to be sitting here with Michael, uh, based in the US, I'm based in Melbourne, and I'm Federico Ree from Inspire Talk. So today, Michael, I really want to pick your brain about business systems, about entrepreneurship, and about pretty much your philosophy to success um, as, as a business owner or as an aspiring entrepreneur and really what it takes to become um, that next success story that, that um, we all strive for as, as perhaps young entrepreneurs that we are. So I have a few questions for you to kickstart the conversation, uh, Michael, is what first made you think about becoming an author if we say wind back 30 years or approximately when you first started your career? Well, I'd always been writing, um, so in my mind, one day I would be an author, but you understand I was writing poetry, I was writing fiction, um, but I was always really passionate about the word, um, but I hadn't written a book, and um, I <clears throat> was prompted while doing a seminar seminar in our company then, it was the Michael Thomas Corporation, the seminar was called Key Frustrations in a Small and Growing Business and What to Do About Them. And a stringer from Ballinger Books, which then was a subsidiary of Harper, um, Harper Collins, um, asked me at the end of that seminar, how'd you like to write a book? And I said, about what? He said, the seminar. It's an incredible book. <clears throat> I said, sure. So he said, well, let me go back to speak to my publisher and we'll come back with an offer. And they came back with an offer and I said, yes. And I wrote that book in the next 90 days. And that book was the E-Myth, Why Most Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. That was the first of the E-Myth series of books. Today, there are now, as you know, 29 of those books. And so it sort of led me into a process of writing, 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 writing. But that was the first. Look, it's it's definitely a um, testament to your success as an author. Um, certainly, I've read your book, and I first read your book uh, in my earlier years of business, approximately 20 years ago. And that book was probably the fundamental um, catapult for me to want to start a business, but more more so importantly, how to think as an entrepreneur. Um, I guess. You speak about vision quite a lot um, in your books. Um, back then, did you envisage the successful career, career that you eventually had? Uh, and did you envisage yourself as being that entrepreneur yourself? Well, <clears throat> you understand I didn't start until late. So I wasn't one of those. Um, I started when I was 12 um, selling papers and then a lemonade stand and then and all those stories that you hear. I didn't. So I had no interest in becoming an entrepreneur. Um, I became one simply because I started a business. But I didn't say, I want to be an entrepreneur. That wasn't it at all. Yes. What I saw was an opportunity to have a profound impact on people who owned and operated small businesses, primarily because I was having that impact. And it evolved, you might say, based upon my experience. So based upon my experience was most of the guys I'm meeting who own and operate businesses aren't really successful. And now, understand, many of them would appear to be successful from the outside because they're making a living. It's working. They've got a store. They've got a, a shop. They've got a whatever it was. But if I really look deeply into them, they didn't have a, a success as one would think of success where everything's working. So that moved me to ask the question, so why not? What's missing in this picture? What's the problem? And in asking that question, it raised the issue. Well, what is a small business? And then the whole question, what is an entrepreneur? And then, and then, and then, and so it just evolved. So you might say, that success or failure simply emerges. And it emerges based upon your experiences and how you respond to them. 
it's interesting how you describe success in, in that particular way and we all have our own philosophies or, or ambitions to be successful per se and my I guess um, definition of, of successful entrepreneurship is the ability to deal with those failures, to have a vision, to have a dream uh, and, and to very much uh, define your own formula to success and you've got a formula to success um, and, and I'd like to sort of really pick your brain around that and the context I guess of this interview is about how do we awaken the entrepreneur within and I know you've actually written a book um, in the past called that um, how do you transform yourself from the ordinary to the extraordinary so that you can compete you can tolerate the ups and downs of that bumpy ride um, in the business so I guess what would be the first thing that comes to mind about awakening that entrepreneur and and, and essentially um, committing yourself to that journey of going from ordinary to extraordinary well, I think of it as a, as a process. I think of everything as a process. Um, and of course, a process is simply a system over time. So when I think of that question, I think of the five essential functions of a business, a company. And the first of those is inspiration. The second is education. The third is application. Fourth is implementation, and the fifth is continuous improvement. So the product of inspiration is an epiphany. And so I'm suggesting that we're continually being called to see the world in a new way. And to the degree we're resistant to responding to that call to see the world in a new way, um, it's over. So no inspiration no evolution. No evolution, forget the whole thing. Because then all we've got is what we've got and what we do is what we do and who we are is who we are and there's no evolution, no process for improvement whatsoever even though we might be improving our um, our speaking skills or we might be improving our um, technical skills um, at code or whatever, but that's tactical it's not strategic okay yep. so when I speak about inspiration I'm speaking about an epiphany and I'm saying that's the accountability of an entrepreneur in founding a company that company must be a source of inspiration to the degree the company is not a source of inspiration the company is dead in the water so it's fundamental the second is education once I'm so inspired, then education brings understanding. So now I'm inspired, I have an epiphany, now I want to know more. That's what education is all about. Education doesn't precede inspiration, though education itself may create an inspiration. But I'm saying inspiration is an intentional act of the best among us. So I have to bring something to you that's going to switch your gears for you. Um, otherwise, we're just having the same old, same old, same old. And who wants to have the same old, same old, same old? Uh, well, more people than you would imagine. So education is critical. And education produces understanding, and that's part of the business we're in. So e-myth and all my work has been inspirational. So when I get countless emails or letters or responses from people saying, Michael, I read your book, you changed my life. That's all inspiration. The second key to that, obviously, for it to take hold is education. Because now I need to have a better understanding of what is so inspiring. The third step is application. And application is critical because until I can actually apply it, actually do it, it loses its energy. So until I can actually pragmatically experience it in what I do, um, it just simply becomes an academic conversation. Um, meaning I go to a personal growth seminar and get all jacked up and then I go home and here I am again, same old guy, same old guy, yes. same old guy. So I'm not talking about motivation, I'm talking about inspiration. Yes. Most personal growth is about motivation. I don't believe in motivation. Motivation is an inner game. 
meaning motivation is what happens inside of me when I've been inspired, when I've now gained further understanding, when I begin to apply it and then get an experience of it, I then am driven to move it wider, and that's what implementation is. So you start with inspiration, education, application, which is a personal experience, and now I want to spread that personal experience wider. That means I want to implement it within the structure of our organization. So all of this, you can see, has to do with people coming to work here in order to produce something which is transformational, not just doable, and in order for that to occur, they have to be inspired. They have to understand. They have to have a personal experience. They have to be driven to grow. And in that case, then, they come to continuous improvement, which is really mentoring. And in fact, nothing really is good enough, ever. Um, I call it the Jobs effect. Nothing is good enough, ever. Steve Jobs, nothing is good enough, ever. Ray Kroc, nothing is good enough, ever. So understand that mantra, nothing is good enough, ever. Good, better, best good, better, best, nothing is good enough ever is the driving force underlying that entrepreneurial um, individual, that entrepreneurial personality that is seeking more, seeking more, seeking more. Yes. It's never ended. Thanks for sharing that formula to success, Michael, and your philosophy to success, I guess. And as you were speaking, uh, there were certain words that for me resonated. And I'd like to kind of go a little bit deeper into that, that area, particularly of education. Um, some people might argue that talent is, is equally important, if not more important than education, or perhaps even having connections. The right connections would be the formula to success or maybe the, the highway to success. So what is your philosophy around education, considering also talent and having the right connections? Well, you see, nothing, is, everything is necessary but insufficient. So inspiration is necessary, but insufficient. Education is necessary, but insufficient. Application is necessary, but in, insufficient. Implementation is necessary, but insufficient. And continuous improvement is necessary, but insufficient. So it's how you define education. And my definition of education is understanding. Oh, so that's what you mean when you say that. So understanding is critical because it's a shift in the mindset of the individual who's going through this process. So when you look at the process, inspiration, education, application, implementation, continuous proof, it's a personal process, but it's also an organizational process. So when you start, suddenly come into relationship with that process, you can see it's dynamic. It's not static. People think you create a system, there it is, that's it, done. Or they say, you know, now I don't have to be there anymore because I've done it. Now I've got a system that works and Jerry's working and Judy's working it, so I'm free just to screw around. Well, that's stupid. So anybody who reads my books to think that what I'm really suggesting is you get to stop working, you get to stop growing, you get to stop improving, you get to, it's just dumb. It's just a dumb way of thinking about this. It's dynamic. It's not static. So, so success, in quotes, isn't an end game. You understand? I don't become successful. It's a continual I've written process. 29 books. I've written 29 books. I've published 29 books. Um, my books are among the most successful business books in the world. And yet, I'm not done. And so I'm not done because there's always this question, then what, then what, then what, then what? You understand? And if I'm not driven by that question, if I'm not driven by that dynamic, by that continuous evolution, that process, um, then it dies. So ultimately, it stops being dynamic and becomes static. And static is death. 
I guess the listeners out there are probably asking the question and wondering, okay, what, what does this all look like in practice on a day-to-day? Um, and obviously, as you start to pull back the layers or you start digging deep, there's a lot of work to be done uh, for any uh, aspiring entrepreneur or anyone that wants to become successful per se. And one thing that I've, I've certainly been a, a big ambassador for, because I am a coach myself and a mentor, is, is to have the right mentors and coaches to be able to guide you through the steps and to be there to support you. What is your experience, philosophy or, or, or opinion on, on having the right coach or the right mentor as you embark on this journey of becoming successful or having that next McDonald's or that next uh, big business? Well, I think it's determined by you as you move through your life. In short, you find yourself without something. You can't quite put a finger on it. You don't know exactly what it is. And so you proceed to find what it is you perceive yourself to need, and it shows up. And so I'm effectively saying it shows up. Now, it might show up in the form of a coach. It might show up in the form of, in quotes, a mentor. It might show up in form of, quotes, your mother. It might show up in the form of whatever. But the only question really is, is are you open to what shows up? <clears throat> I'm given to say that if Jesus were to appear um, at Radio City Music Hall, um, under another name, would anybody know it's Jesus? Or if Moses were to say, let's get out of here and come to the Red Sea, would anybody know it's Moses? In short, who are these lunatics? And I'm effectively saying that I learn and am moved and inspired by many, 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 many different things. And yet I've had teachers every step of the way. So my saxophone teacher, or the guy who taught me how to sell encyclopedias, or the guy who taught me how to frame a house, or the guy who taught, you understand, all these teachers who come, the only question is, am I available to them? So I could spend a lot of time with a coach and absolutely waste all that time because I become subordinate to a track He's taking me on. And that track that he's taking me on may be exactly the opposite of the track I ought to be on. And the determination of that is a very tricky thing. I mean, it's really, really, really very tricky. Because, as an example, we've worked with over 100,000 small business clients in my companies. 100,000 small business in 145 countries, every industry imaginable. I have never walked into a small business that worked, ever, not once. In short, so I say we fix broken businesses. But in the reality, as we're fixing broken businesses, I come to the reality that in fact they're broken, not because there's something wrong with the business, but because there's something wrong with the guy who owns the business. And so we came to the realization that while ostensibly, while we're working to fix that broken business, we're not really working to fix that broken business. We're really working to fix that broken mindset. Because until your mindset shifts, and most often very dramatically, nothing is going to shift around you. So just to conclude on that point of is it worthy to have a coach or a mentor, what you're saying or what I'm interpreting from what you're saying is it's okay to have a mentor or a coach, but it's it's up to you to be open to that process of learning and transformation uh, and that continual improvement. Plus, it's um, also important to surround yourself with uh, people who are inspirational or who empower you or push you to the next level. So it's not really just about having one coach. It's about having an experience with many people along the way, along the journey. So it's it's sort of a, a sort of reinforcing my philosophy and and resonating with what you're saying, Michael. So thank you with with that point. I guess let, let me let me add one other thing about that. Sure. If you want to grow your company, don't get a coach who hasn't grown his company. If you want to learn how to 
deal with people in your company, don't get a coach who hasn't done that successfully. So there's lots of people who love to coach, but they don't know anything. In other words, they've created a pattern for themselves, but they don't know shit. And so because they don't know shit, that's what they sell. And suddenly you're buying shit. And you can stay in the shit for a long, long, long time or leave it thinking there's something wrong with you. No, there's something wrong with the coach. Now, on the other hand, if he does know, meaning he has done it, then if you, in fact, are going to acquire his logic, his context, his wisdom, then you better listen to it. Otherwise, it's a stupid relationship. And so when I say lots of people love my books, but most people don't do my books. You better listen. I love that quote. Um, So just moving on, Michael, with with the challenges that business owners face, um, the struggles, um, the setbacks, the failures, the ups and downs, what, what is one typical common challenge that perhaps young entrepreneurs today face, particularly the, um, the young millennials, you know, who are entering the workforce, have great ambitions, are always dreaming, they think anything is possible. What are the realities of, of starting a business in, in today's competitive environment? Well, uh, first of all, the reality is the same today as it was a um, hundred years ago. The reality hasn't changed, despite the fact that stuff has changed, meaning today it's the internet, yesterday it was, it, everything changes, but nothing changes. So the failure rate of business hasn't changed at all. In short, when I started 40 years ago, it was X. It's still X. And understand, it hasn't gotten worse, it hasn't gotten better, it's still the same. So stupid is stupid is stupid, it doesn't change. You understand, effectively, the millennials are no different than the baby boomers. Now understand the way they were raised, the culturation that occurred, the mindsets that are shared, the impact of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, blah, 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 social, in quotes, media, has altered their perceptions of reality but reality hasn't changed. So the critical thing to understand is reality hasn't changed. And if reality hasn't changed, then something very fundamental has to occur. And the first thing to do is get rid of millennial. Get rid of the categorization. Scrap it. Because all it does is make it worse. Oh, I'm talking to a millennial, ergo. Oh, I'm talking to a baby boomer, ergo. You follow what I mean. All of a sudden, I'm in a box. And when I'm in that box, then I'm putting him or her in that box. So now we're in that box together. And those associations that everybody, in quotes, has about millennials, about baby boomers, about reality, about unreality, about social, about unsocial, about relationship, about no relationship, about the word friends. Are they really friends? You understand? I've got a lot of friends. Are they really friends? Well, no, because I know the difference between a real friend and you understand. If we remove the categorization, putting that aside, uh, what are the challenges that business owners still face nonetheless in today's world, given that we are operating in a very different world than, say, 30 years ago? Well, the very first challenge is, who am I and what am I here to do? So I've got to ask that question and answer that question. In short, don't categorize myself as an entrepreneur. Don't categorize myself as anything. I'll start with a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind, as I call it, and let's begin the conversation anew. So I'll invite you into the dreaming room, I call it, um, to have this new conversation. And this new conversation will take any path. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what stimulates what, what inspires who, and so forth and so on. There's no track 
I'm taking you on other than to say that an entrepreneur is really four different personalities. The dreamer, the thinker, the storyteller, and the leader. So I'm saying every entrepreneur is a dreamer, a thinker, a storyteller, and a leader. And if he or she is not, he is not an entrepreneur. So if an entrepreneur is not a dreamer, forget it. It's already over. Then it's called stupid business. If an entrepreneur isn't a thinker, thinker, I'm saying forget it. Because it will never scale. If an entrepreneur isn't a storyteller, then what in the hell is he? And if an entrepreneur isn't a leader, well, you understand. It's obvious then that the most critical process at the beginning with a blank piece of paper is to awaken the dreamer, the thinker, the storyteller, and the leader. Because what are we really doing? We're discovering the true entrepreneur. So, Michael, can I just butt in here and say or assume that if you don't have all four areas ticked, then potentially you are you are likely to fail as an entrepreneur? Well, what I'm saying is you must develop all four. They're necessary. Can you outsource They're one essential. of those? I'm sorry? Can you outsource one of those areas? No. No. You can't outsource anything that is fundamentally critical to being an entrepreneur, which means being a leader, being a dreamer, being a thinker, being a storyteller. So you have to have a relationship with that. And so that's the biggest and most difficult part at the beginning. Because the most difficult part at the beginning is because most people lead superficial lives, terrible conclusion to reach, but most people do. Most people lead superficial lives, meaning most people accept superficial answers to superficial questions, then they're bound to create something ultimately dissatisfying because it is and ends up being superficial. So you understand that Ray Kroc at McDonald's didn't create a superficial business. The rigor, the absolute rigor that he applied in the creation of that company would stun 99% of all people on the face of this planet. They just couldn't pursue it with that. Now, you add to that, he was 52 years old when he started. And you obviously say, so what in the world? Well, obviously, I got to learn something. So I'm inviting people to come to entrepreneur school. I've, in fact, been in the business of awakening the entrepreneur within everybody I talk to. Because if I can't do that, forget about everything else. You understand? Everything else is just a waste of time. Absolutely. Look, I'm, I'm really keen to drill a little bit deeper in the dreaming part, the first step, I guess, or one of the first critical steps. Um, on a day-to-day, -day, what does that look like in terms of dreaming? Because I've met a lot of people who are dreamers and you see them sort of floating around with big ideas, but they don't necessarily <laughs> put them into action um, and they end up not really achieving anything. No, that, that, that's daydreaming. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentional dreaming. And so you understand I have a reason for being. And that reason for being, that great result this company is here to produce was best evoked if you remember, did, have you read the book Steve Jobs? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, did you watch the movie? No. Okay, go get the movie. And when you get the movie, in the movie, there's a, a, a brief moment where they replay the um, commercial that Apple ran at the Super Bowl. Watch that. And the minute you see that, you'll understand Apple. And if you don't understand Apple when you watch that, you miss the whole thing. That's what I mean by meaning. And that's what I mean by the great result. So when you watch that commercial, you get to the heart of Steve Jobs. There's no question about it. You get to the heart of Steve Jobs. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Right in the face of everybody. 
And that's why in that movie, you'll see the audience waiting for the launch of a new product and jobs got up and he would do that from time to time. He get in front of the audience and launch a new product and they're all just charged, right? It was that commercial living its life in reality in that unreasonable, unreasonable, unimaginably unreasonable company called Apple. So in that in that in that phrase you use of intentional dreaming on a day to day, what are examples of how you can intentionally dream um, if you're running a business? It's not a day to day to day to day to day to day to thing. I have a dream done. So understand I had a dream and I set it in 1977 and I'm living it today. And my dream then was to transform the state of small business worldwide. That was my dream. That was the dream of our very first company, the Michael Thomas Corporation. So can that, that was the dream. Can, can, that be, can that be translated as your legacy uh, or as your, 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 your vision, your end game, your mission? Are those words related? It could be. Yep. It could be. Of course, they're all related. All these words are related, by the way, to each other. They're one thing. While there are four things, they're one thing. So you understand the dream is a great result. The vision is the form the company will take in order to produce that great result. The purpose is the impact it will have on my most important consumer. And the mission is to invent the system through which that can be scaled worldwide. So the dream, the vision, the purpose, and the mission, and then I can say to you, so Federico, what's your dream? What's your vision? What's your purpose? What's your mission? And you suddenly realize we're in a conversation about the meaning of my company, of so, your company. So let me ask you the question, Michael. You've, you've written many books. Um, you've had a, a career of success over many decades, but now you've, you've, you've once again uh, put in the effort and, and made the commitment of writing another book called Beyond the E-Myth. What is your your purpose, your legacy behind this book? What are you trying to ultimately achieve given that you know your other books have provided lots of great content and plenty of material there to learn from? Well, let, let me define, you've used the word legacy and everybody uses the word in, 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 in their way. Let me define what I mean by legacy. Um, the reality is every single life on the planet will leave a legacy. Legacy is what you leave when you leave. Legacy is the impact you had before you left. Legacy is the ball game. So effectively, if you were to say, what's my legacy? My legacy is the outcome of what I've created from the day I was born to the moment I'm here that's my legacy, which then says everybody's got a legacy. Everybody. Then the question is, if everybody's got a legacy, meaning every life leaves a legacy, then it would be really valuable for you to ask yourself, so what is the legacy I wish to leave? You, you got it. Yes. And by essentially saying that, you go back to the E-Myth Revisited, where I talk about your crap out date and essentially writing the script, your eulogy at your own funeral. So what would you say about your life at your funeral? Here lies Federico, says Federico on an audio tape telling the story and then you tell the story, that's your legacy. So we create our legacy. You can't help but create. You started the moment you took your first breath. You follow me? Yes. So first of all, that's the legacy. So second of all, your question was? What was your purpose, your vision behind Beyond the E-Myth? Well, Beyond the E-Myth was to make it simpler for people to do. The fact of the matter is, I said it earlier, millions of people have read my books love my books. I love your book. I just love your book. You just changed my life, et cetera, and so forth. And I say, prove it. And if I ask them to prove it, they didn't do it. So they love my book, but they didn't do it. So I'm saying to myself, is that my legacy? 
I write a book people love, but they don't do it. Or only a very, very small fraction of people do it. I don't want that to be my legacy. So I'm going to write the final book. It's called Beyond the E-Myth, The Evolution of an Enterprise, from a company of one to a company of 1,000. And I'm going to write it so simply, eight steps. Step one, step two to eight. Eight steps for creating an extraordinary enterprise. And then I'll take people through it. So that's what this new book is designed to do, to truly create a revolution. And I imagine every single little company right there in Melbourne, Australia, wherever the hell you might be, every single little company on every street in Melbourne, the owner of that company comes to school. I call it Mike Lee Gerber's Entrepreneur School 101. And I'm going to take every single one of you through this process. It's something to do. It's not something just to think about. It's not just something to be awed by. It's not just something to be warmed by. It's not just something not maybe inspired by. It's something to do. I, I heard you say this will this will be your last book. I hope it won't be your last book because I'm sure that future no, no, generations no, no, will be my last it's my last e myth book. Okay. Well ho hopefully yep. not because I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that will be upset to know <laughs> that this is your last e myth book. Um, look uh, Michael I'm conscious of your time and um, we need to wrap up very shortly. I guess um, just for the viewers um, listening to this podcast, and, and I guess just to summarize some of your uh, best quotes that I've kind of noted here, you, you talk about um, you better listen to your coach. Um, reality hasn't changed. Who am I and what do I want to do? Um, pretty much being a dreamer, a thinker, a storyteller, and a leader. And um, welcome to the new entrepreneurial school. Um, which is very much your 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 legacy um, and your mission uh, to educate um, people out there in the world. I guess one last question I have for you, Michael, is in relation to the present let and the future. Stop, let me stop you for one second. <clears throat> Not to educate, to inspire, to teach, to train, to coach, to mentor people through inspiration, education, application, implementation, continuous improvement, to do it, and therefore to be it. So first, to be it, and then to do it. What? Transform the state of small business worldwide. So obviously there's a lot of depth behind your, your teachings, and obviously it's important and key to read those books so that one can really grasp the whole the whole context of, of what you're saying and putting it into practice is the key. So I guess just to wrap up, Michael, one last question I have is about the present and the future in terms of the trends, the shifts. Um, you know, what do you envisage the entrepreneurial space to look like in, in five, ten years' time, given that everyone wants to be an entrepreneur these days? <laughs> well, first of all, everybody doesn't. And second, want to be an entrepreneur these days. And second, um, to be exactly the same as it is now. Understand that until and unless what I'm bringing to bear on small business is actually employed by the vast majority of people who go into business, exactly the same thing will occur. It is so clear that we will become the preeminent provider of economic development services worldwide when a great body of individuals come to school and then learn and practice what they learn there. That's the outcome of what we intend to create. Michael, look, I'd like to really thank you for your time, your insights, your, your, your plenty of words of wisdom. Uh, I've really enjoyed it personally, and I do hope that you can come to Australia and preach your, your philosophies, your teachings, your experiences um, to all these young aspiring entrepreneurs that seem to pop up everywhere in Australia. Um, so thanks again, and um, look, I do hope to meet you one day face-to-face -face in person, whether here in Australia or overseas. So here's the perfect thing to do. Put together 10,000 of those people, put them in an auditorium, and then bring me over for a day, and I will change their minds completely. Look, you've, you've planted a seed in my brain, so hopefully that will eventuate down the track. So thanks again for that um, for that tip and, and um, objective, Michael. Thank you. I delight.